Sapphire Technology was founded all the way back in 2001, and they're still active today, producing a few different variants in the AMD RX 6000 lineup. However, we're not going to be looking at those cards today, because they're very expensive and hard to get. Luckily, I have the next best thing, the HD 4650. Okay, so it's not really the next best thing, but it used to be a pretty solid card. Released to the public on September 10th, 2008, the 4650 was a mid-range graphics card with an attractive price tag of only $60. For a graphics card, that is unheard of nowadays. Either way, I paid $15 for this one a few weeks ago when I found that it shipped in its original packaging. That's something I want to mention because the box advertisement definitely grabbed my attention. I think my favorite part is the bright yellow text exclaiming, play the Vista way on the back of the box. Like, no, no thank you, I don't think I want to play anything the Vista way, but I get what they were going for. The advertising boasts of a whole 512 megabytes of video memory on the card, and how it helps boost realism with support for Shader Model 4.1. And even though Nvidia already released cards with DirectX 11, it almost brags about this card's support for DirectX 10.1 and how it will blow you away with its stunning 3D graphics. Although not supporting the latest features, the 4650 still traded blows with the GeForce 9 series from Nvidia, primarily the similarly priced 9500 GT and 9600 GT. Here's one benchmark I found between the 9500 GT and the 4650, and the 4650 was substantially faster. When it came to raw performance, it seemed to be a capable card, with one reviewer stating that it was even a reasonable performer in games running a resolution of 1280 by 1024 That's not the best, but performance wasn't always the main selling point. The 4650 was also a very efficient card, delivering up to three times the performance per watt of AMD's previous generation GPUs. But to answer the question, was it better than the available Nvidia cards at the same price point? I would say no, solely because the lack of support for DX11 was a major disadvantage to Team Red. But enough talk, it's time to actually unbox it. I bought this card off the online Goodwill store for $15 a few weeks back and it recently arrived. Inside this cardboard box within a cardboard box was a few different things. I got a CD with the drivers, an installation guide, and an invitation to join the Sapphire Select Club. Oh yeah, I also got an HD 4650, and it came with a few different interchangeable brackets. Immediate impressions were good though, and I was just happy that the card was mostly clean. It did show some signs of use with dust buildup in a few different places, but it wasn't too bad. I've handled far more contaminated cards before. Either way, it's likely still running the original thermal paste, so I decided to replace it with some Corsair TM30. Apparently, this is quote unquote performance thermal paste, and will hopefully be giving this old graphics card the best chance in benchmarks. Reaching the actual chip was as simple as unscrewing four screws holding down the aluminum heatsink, but I took it completely apart for a more thorough cleaning. It's clearly not the strongest cooler, but it didn't need much considering the TDP was a mere 48 watts. But while I have it all torn apart, what exactly was under the hood of this 14 year old graphics card? Well, built on the 55 nanometer process and the RV730 architecture, this 4650 came with a core clock of 600 megahertz. It also had 320 shading units, 32 texture mapping units, 8 render output units, 4 compute units, and 512 megabytes of DDR2 VRAM clocked at 400 megahertz with a 128-bit bus width. But this wasn't the only 4650 offered by Sapphire. In fact, they had two other versions with one gigabyte of VRAM, one with AGP, and the other with PCIe 2.0. There's also another variant that's an overclocked edition running 650MHz on the core and 900MHz on the memory, which is an overclock of 50MHz and 400MHz respectively. It also uses the superior GDDR3 memory and was actually one of the best 4650s due to this. The version I have is unceremoniously known as the low profile version according to Tech Power Up and was the worst 4650 offered by Sapphire. That's not to say that this card couldn't be overclocked though, but I'll get into that later in the benchmarks. For now, I've got to actually install it. The test bench today isn't the most powerful computer, but it's strong enough for this card. At the heart of the system is an i3-4130, a dual-core chip released back in 2013 that came clocked at 3.4GHz. It also has two 8GB sticks of DDR3 memory, so I'm confident that the 4650 will be the bottleneck of the system. Now, I could have swapped out the full height bracket for a low profile one, but it doesn't make a difference because the case has been previously modified to circumvent this. Because of that, installation was as easy as plug and play. The last step was to actually update the drivers, and upon completion, I ran a few different tests. While we're waiting for that, take a moment and consider leaving a like or subscribing because you made it this far into the video, which means there's a decent chance you actually enjoyed the content. Thanks. 
The first test I ran was a synthetic one of 3D Mark Vantage, which was released in 2008, the same year as the 4650. After a while, it managed to achieve a GPU score of 1574 using the performance preset, which was on par with other results I found online. I then ran the test again, this time with the highest overclock allowed by MSI Afterburner. This was largely me just dragging the sliders all the way to the right and starting it over, but the new core clock sat at 778MHz and the new memory clock was sitting at 520MHz. And somehow this was stable. I figured it would instantly crash since the core was clocked higher than even the factory overclocked edition, but it didn't and was actually stable. Upon completion, the overclocked benchmark achieved a GPU score of 2200, an increase of about 40%. But this gain in performance didn't always occur in actual games. The next thing I did was attempt to answer the question, can it run Crisis, and played some Crisis Warhead. And yeah, it can, depending on which settings you use. With the resolution of 720p, I used the in-game optimized feature, which automatically set the game to gamer quality, which is roughly medium to high in most other games. The 4650 only managed to pull an average frame rate of 17 FPS with these settings, so I switched over to the minimum preset which used the lowest settings. This increased the average frame rate all the way to 48 FPS, which is more than enough to play this game with. I also tried a bit of overclocking, but it didn't really impact performance, so I opted to run the rest of the games at stock speeds. The next game I ran was Counter-Strike Global Offensive. I opted for the lowest settings to maintain as high a frame rate as possible, but I tried a few different resolutions. I used the Steam Overlay because Afterburner didn't want to work with CSGO, and in 720p the average frame rate sat around 60fps. Increasing the resolution to 1600 by 900 dropped the frame rate between 30 to 40 FPS, and increasing the resolution to 1080p dropped the frame rate between 20 and 30 FPS. Honestly, better than I expected. I think 900p offered the best balance between performance and visuals, but the game still felt playable in lower resolutions. Following that was Grand Theft Auto V. This one unfortunately performed about as well as I expected it to. With a resolution of 800 by 600 and all the lowest settings applied, the average frame rate was a measly 22 FPS. I tried overclocking and switching between DirectX 10 and 10.1 and none of it really influenced the frame rate in any meaningful way. Although it wasn't the best frame rate, it was still enough for me to drive around the city with, and it was stable. Just not exactly the gaming experience I think most people are after. Afterwards, I played a bit of Left 4 Dead 2. In this game, I tried a few different configurations, all with a resolution of 1080p. With a mixture of high and medium settings, the game ran, just not well, with an average frame rate of 22 FPS. I wanted to increase this a bit, so I opted to use the low settings instead, which over doubled the previous average, achieving an impressive 51 FPS. I noticed that large explosions did cause the frame rate to nearly half sometimes, but it always quickly recovered and was very stable throughout testing. Up next was Far Cry 3. I wanted to run this game because it was a AAA title that was released 4 years after this graphics card, meaning that it should stress it by quite a bit. And it did! Even with a resolution of 720p and all the lowest settings, the average frame rate was only 26 FPS. You could increase that figure by lowering the resolution a bit, but from my experience, anything below 720p can affect playability. Portal 2 came out 3 years after the 4650 did, but it still ran well. With the settings set to low, I was able to turn the resolution all the way up to 1080p and still got an average frame rate of 59 FPS. There were a few torn frames here and there, but it was nothing that a bit of V-Sync couldn't fix. The last game I tested was Half-Life 2. It's a bit of a throwaway benchmark since the game is so easy to run, but with medium settings and 1080p, the 4650 averaged 49 FPS. It wasn't as common to play games in 1080p back when the card was released, but it's proven that it can handle it in a few different titles. In my books, that alone shows that it held up pretty well, considering that it wasn't the flagship card when it was released. So, overall, does it hold up in 2021? Mm, kinda. It's fine for playing back media and watching YouTube videos, and it can get away with some lighter or older games, but it can't be used for much else. The 4650 would be much more capable if it supported DirectX 11, but it doesn't, and only becomes increasingly outdated with each day that passes. The 4650 really is a thing of the past in 2022. It wasn't anything special when it was released, and it sure isn't today. It's just a peek into computational history that I didn't care about as it occurred. Oh, we also have a community discourse server where we discuss a variety of topics. Link in description. Regardless, thank you for watching and I hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any questions or related comments, then leave them below and I'll be sure to respond to it. While you're at it, consider subscribing or leaving a like because it genuinely helps me out. That's about it.
have a great day. Bye.